This podcast is brought to you by Aetna. Learn how Aetna is working to build a healthier world by visiting aetnastory.com. Dora, have you given any thought as to how you want to bring in 2020? I can't believe it's so close that the year is coming to an end and we're coming into a new year. Yes, we're hosting in partnership with the Gasparilla Inn a wellness experience on January 27th in Boca Grande, Florida. What's going to happen down there? We're going to be doing cooking demonstrations. We're going to be walking on the beach. We're going to be doing yoga every morning. We're going to be learning from world-class teachers on how to take better care of ourselves. I mean, it's just going to be amazing. So go to our website, bbrconsulting.us, to learn more and to sign up. And we look forward to seeing you on January 27th. Can't wait to see you all there. People are yearning for information. Having the opportunity to encourage people and to educate people and inspire people. It's amazing to be able to say we'll carve out time to take care of ourselves. There's something for everyone. Santana Moss is a television and radio analyst and former American football wide receiver who played in the National Football League for 14 seasons. He played college football for the University of Miami and played professionally for the New York Jets for four seasons and our beloved Washington Redskins for 10 seasons. Moss was selected as an All-Pro in 2005. Santana, you are a legend in Miami and D.C. at the age of 39, which is incredible. Mm. Today, we want to talk to you about what you've learned about life through your football career and how you've applied your lessons in life after football. So can you tell us your journey to becoming a professional athlete and how did you create your path to the NFL? You know what? It's not a day that I don't think about where this thing all started from. I swear to you, it's like I reiterate myself to my kids over and over and over and it's beyond what I've become it's about where they can go with theirs and I'm like man I saw this when I was six so my son like I can't remember nothing when I was six well I do and I remember (laughs) being that kid at home down in Liberty City down in Miami Florida and I remember looking around me and just saying you know I watch a lot of documentaries I watch a lot of movies and especially the stuff from other folks who either made it in you know, being musicians or entertainers or even guys who have professional careers like myself in sports. I listen to a lot of these stories and there's so many similarities when you hear these guys talk about how they was brought up, what fueled their fire. And I can tell you straight up, I was different than other kids. I can't say I was different because I was better. No, it was a ton of kids that I grew up with that I wanted to be like, but I was different mentally because I've always thought about the future. I always thought about wanting more. I always wasn't satisfied with what I saw around me. And to tell you the truth, you know, when you're young and you don't really have means needing money or don't even know the value of a dollar and you're just living and you know your mom and your dad handling and whatever we have, they're doing it. Someone is taking care of this. You shouldn't have those thoughts in your head. You shouldn't have no worries. But I did. And those worries came at a young age. And when they came, it came for a reason. It motivated me to go out and say, well, if this is how they have it, then I want something more. And I just pushed through it. I mean, I was told early, you know, that I had a gift. I was always running. My grandmother used to tell me, <laughs> God bless the dead. She's always said that that boy run up and down them streets and he run up and down my house. They used to push me outside early in the morning because you'll hear me stumping. I'm going up and down the wall. <laughs> you hear me doing something. And then eventually, you know, I just felt that. I can make something out of my life with, you know, my God-given ability. And that's, you know, my athleticism really showed me early that I can be a football player and maybe have a stint in track. I didn't really know much about track when I was young. I just know I ran a lot. But football was always number one. And when I first said that I wanted to do that about six or seven, that was my goal. I said, you know what, I'm going to be like those guys I see going up that expressway pass in front of my grandmother's house. That was the Miami Dolphins at the time. I wanted to be them. I said, I'm going to be like that one day. Did you have any mentors who encouraged you? You know, it's odd when people hear the stories of other athletes and they say, yeah, you know, I was encouraged by this guy or, or that famous person or this particular athlete. I think my encouragement started first at home. You know, my mm. mom and dad worked their behinds off, so I was able to watch them. It's odd because I grew up to look at myself as like, man, this reminds me of everything that was in my house. When it came down to things that I've seen that I've done or how I treat my kids, it's almost about what I saw, how I mm. do things. It's crazy because as a family, 
You think most families sit down at the table together, they talk everything out. No, we didn't do a lot of that. When we ate, yeah, it was going to be ready, and everybody getting their meal, Now go watch TV or do what you was doing, but as long as you got your food. We didn't sit and have those big family discussions, but in the day— I found my dad and my mom always dropping jewels when they had a chance to. If I was by myself in the car, my dad was telling me how he grew up. Some of the mm-hmm. guys that's on the corner who used to be bad and playing drums or who was bad and running up and down the football field and, and look at them now. And, you know, I found it odd. My dad is sharing these stories with me, but they came to shape my life, shape who I became. Because when I saw those guys now by myself, now with my dad, I'm like, man, why is this guy living like this? And... My dad and my mom, at the time, I didn't know. They were showing me things, physically showing it to me and saying, like, look, this is what he did. This is what he used to be, telling me how this kid was such a household name, you know, in that neighborhood or whatever, their high school, and now he's a junkie or now he's, a, you know, a bum. And no offense to those people because you never know what they go through, but that's who influenced me the most, my father, them, because they showed me that, yeah, you know, we bust our behinds for you guys. We might not be the people that you look up to on TV, or some of these other guys or folks you might look up to, but as your parents, we're doing all we have to do to make sure you're not like that. And they was my biggest influencers, and they was my biggest mentors because I just watched them work. It's crazy. Like I said before, I was different. When I say I was different from other kids, because I laugh about mine. You know, you can find yourself spoiling them. You say, hey, I have it, so let me give it to them. And then you find yourself, you know, saying, oh, I got to start taking some back because they take this for granted. They don't really know what it is to not have. So you learn from your mistakes. And that's why I say, you know, as I sit back and think about it, I'm like, man, all this stuff that I can give to my kids, it came from my house. So they was my biggest influencers when it came to just wanting to be successful. I wanted to be successful for them because, I, like I said, I saw how he was coming up. But I also wanted to be successful because no matter what I was going to do or what I was doing, they taught me how to be successful at doing it. You know, they showed me get up in the morning, go to work. Go work for yours. Get up and feed your family. You know, my dad got laid off. I never knew he was laid off. He still got up and went and found work. Mm-hmm. You know, he would leave in the morning. I'm like, oh, my dad going to work again. The whole while, that week, he was scrapping for work, you know. He was out doing something that we didn't know, but it was work. And he come in dirty. I'm like, well, he worked today, but he did something odd because he never comes in this way. And now he's doing construction, and we don't know. Guess what? I'm not going to leave this door open or close this door because one closed on me. No, I got to go into the next door. So I find myself being that person. You know, when something closed, I go around it or go through it or go over it and move on to the next thing because I was taught that from my parents. So you recently got your MBA. Yes, Sort of the same thing. I mean, what inspired you to do that, this idea of remaking yourself? It's odd because when I left and got my undergrad, I was like, oh, I'm not doing (laughs) school anymore. It's a wrap. (laughs) Because, you know, okay, my junior year at University of Miami, it was told to me by scouts and other professionals that, hey, you have a chance to forego your senior year and be a pro. And you would say a guy from where I'm from, The whole objective is to make it. You know, that's Mm -hmm. my only goal, to make it and be able to, you know, have something to give back to my parents. Mm. And you're projected to go first round with your skill set. So any guy in my shoe would say, man, I'm gone. But deep down inside, I felt like, man, the one goal that I want more than anything is to graduate. And at the time, I felt like it would be better to graduate while I'm here than to leave and come back and graduate. I'm not sure because I think about this all the time. What if I would have just jumped out there and did that and then came back because I ended up coming back anyway and got my MBA? How different would it have been? But I can tell you I wasn't ready. Mm. I wasn't ready. Mentally, I still was a kid. You know, I didn't feel like I was ready to go. And I'm like, you know, it's easy to jump out here and say go get what's there, but it might not pan out the way that I wanted to pan out. So, you know what, if it's meant, then it'd be there next year. The whole goal and the whole focus was to continue to be that athlete that I was And at the same time, accomplish the ultimate goal, and that's to graduate. And, you know, I find it odd that I'm talking about this now because when I was younger, I always thought to be successful, you had to graduate from school. That's all I ever was taught. So you learn from folks saying, hey, you get a degree, you get an education, get a degree. That's the key to life. That's the key to success. But that's really not, you know, as I got older and read up on other entrepreneurs, other wealthy men in this world, other people that have wealth, you know, it's not all about getting education. Now, 
you can be self-educated. You can be a guy that got it some other kind of way, or you can be a guy that was in a family that had a business and learned your family trade and still be successful. So as I got older and went to reading more and finding out different things, I was like, man, I'm glad I made it because I really thought that the only way you can be successful is going to school, getting your education, getting your degree. And I found it odd when it's tons of people that has degrees, but they're not successful, you know, because a lot of those degrees don't add up until you have that job. So I'm fortunate. And that's something I tell my kids. Hey, don't look at it and say it's a bad thing. It's still a great thing to go out there and do. But know that it's still a job at task. Once you get it, you have to now apply yourself to what you've learned to try to have a profession. It's not about just having a job. It's a profession. It's a career. And regardless of what career, what profession you pick, that's on you because now you have to just apply everything that you have in you that you learn. How hard is it for former athletes to reimagine their lives and not be stuck after professional football? Okay, it's up to the individual because the one thing I've learned in life, no matter who you are, you're going to go through hardships. I care less who what, when, where, and how, no matter who you are, you're going to go through hardships. That's right. And the richest of rich men have been through hardships. The wealthiest of the wealthier, they have been through hardships. So what makes you different? What makes you the exception that you're not going to be that person that go through the hard times? And it's all about how you handle the situation, handle the task at hand. If you've been a guy that has always quit, then you're going to find yourself quitting. If you've been a guy that you say, I'm not going to settle, then you're going to find yourself finding a way. And I'll be the first to tell you, I've been through so many hard times. And I look back and I say, how am I able to overcome it? Because I've been down this journey before at a different time in my life. Dana, what would be one of your hardest journeys? Having people steal money from me. You know, mm-hmm. we shared this story. I, we talked about it so much and it was talked about more, not me, but you know, I don't go down that path because once it's done, I clip the cord and keep going. But it happened. And I don't blame those folks. I don't. You think I will? I don't blame them because the first thing they tell you when you get a bunch of money or you get the money that we get as athletes, find financial advisors, find somebody to take care of. I did all that. I crossed all my T's and dotted my I's. But then they didn't tell you that those individuals, just because that profession, they don't mean they will be thieves or they don't mean they're going to really have your best interests. And so then I'm like, man, what well, damn, you didn't tell me that. But that's up to me. You know what I'm saying? So I don't get mad. I just feel like I should have paid more attention. And at the same time, hey, you know what? You only learn from your mistakes. You have to take L some time mm-hmm. to understand what a win is. And to be honest with you, if I would have dwelled and I would allow that to affect my everyday, then, yeah, maybe you wouldn't be talking to me mm-hmm. right now. And mm-hmm. I would never do that mm-hmm. to myself. So I found out in life that, any and everything you do, you have to persevere. You have to find a way to say, hey, I understand that it's going to be highs, it's going to be lows. I've always told myself I never want to get too high or too low. So I stay in between. And people find it, oh, man, Tanner, you this and that. My friends look at me all the time and say, bro, you this, you that, but you don't act. I act like the next Joe Blow. I tell them that's how I treat you, so treat me the same way. I have people that I admire in life that I would never go up to them and tell them. As long as I saw them, Okay, I'm sold. I'm good. I saw the person was on my bucket list. I didn't have to go up and shake his hand. I saw him. I visually saw this guy. I'm good. Because that's just me. Yeah. I don't feel like no one's bigger than the next person, you know? Just because you went to be a cafeteria worker don't make you as a police officer bigger than him or her. You know what I mean? I feel like we all equal. We just mm-hmm. have different professions. So, therefore, whatever, you a star in all these kids that you take care of that come in here and eat in your cafeteria line. You a star in all these folks that you fight crime with and fight crime for and save and protect. You a star because the people that pay attention to your podcast, to your television show, we all have our own fans. So regardless of who are your fan, you're special to someone. And that's how I look at life. I don't look at people bigger than the other. I just feel like, hey, you might have a little more money because your job gives that amount. Mm -hmm. And just because she gets less don't mean you're bigger than her. You know what I mean? She might be qualified or have more, you know, that I get from her than you because, you know, it's not about your pay grade. I love that. I heard someone say one time, if you're humble, you don't stumble. And it sounds like you live that. The humble man always stay on top. And that's something that's crazy. I find myself going back and watching film of myself from my playing days. 
And when I was in college, I never even knew that I said it. But someone on IG sent me a video of myself. You know, I was being interviewed, and I said, the humble man always stay on top. I mean, I appreciate everything I do. But I know, like I said before, if I go out and do something that awes you, I know what it took for me to awe you. Hard work. I'm That's not all right. by it. I bust my ass to be that guy. That's right. You know what I mean? So, therefore, I appreciate what I've done for you with what I've done, but I know it's still a job at hand. I got to continue to be that person. I got to go ahead and put that behind me and move forward. Mm. And that's why now I go back because when I was playing, I couldn't go back. If I ever looked back, I found I cheated myself a day of moving ahead. And so that's, that's what I do with life that's now. True. You know what I mean? Like I say, we all have hard times. You don't know what I'm dealing with day to day, but guess what? Why let you know? Why dwell? Why sit and move? <laughs> Let me keep moving. You know, and at the end of the day, you know, if the only way I can leave it <laughs> behind me is to move forward. If I That's sit right. and play around, it's, it's never going to escape. So I'm so never going to have a way to get away from it, you know? So true. And so that's why I say I cut my losses and keep it moving because what's lost is what lost. I can't do nothing about what I don't have. All I can do is what I can go get. And it's funny because, you know, you like really are amazing that you have because uh, people work years and years to be able to, to like come to let that. go of something. So, yeah, yeah, taking responsibility for yourself. It's you. Yeah. You can't blame nobody else. That's why I say, you know, when you go through hard times, look at yourself. What did I do to go through this? Mm -hmm. What role did I play in it? And you're fine all the time. You had the biggest role in whatever you went through. It was you. Whatever it was, whether it was your mind, whether someone convinced you to do it, it's still you at the end of the day. I know that we don't want to look back, mm -hmm. but can you tell us from your perspective how you'll tell your grandchildren? I mean, you probably won't because you're humble, but the Monday Night Miracle. Can you describe <laughs> you it to us, Oh, no, I, I relish it now. Don't get me wrong. I would, like, hey, Tell I would. us what happened that day. What would you have for <sighs> breakfast? Like, Walk us through and okay. then take us to the moment. And how did it happen? <laughs> well, to be honest with you, I shared with you earlier about the grass isn't always greener. Fortunately for me, that year was the best year at that point of my NFL career. I had just came over from the New York Jets. If you knew how I started off, you would be like, wow, look how those years have just molded me to be this guy when it came to that night. To be honest with you, man, it was almost to a point to where I've done so much at a young age for a team exceeded what they expected, and they still wasn't happy, you know? And here I am, like I said, just being humble. Like, I told my agent, hey, I really don't want to leave. If they feel like I need another year to prove to them something, let me do it because that's how I was brought up. You know what? You're not happy. I'm going to make you happy. I'm going to give you a reason to be proud. I know I've done all I can do, and probably I can do more, but at the end of the day, it's up to you to allow me to do that. I have once not having that chance, that opportunity to be more. I've only did what you allowed me to do. So if you want more, give me more. And that's what it was like when I played with the Jets. Now, fast forward, I get traded here after the 04 season to 2005. I can tell you just the whole preparation part of that season, I knew it was going to be special. I know it's going to be special. I went back to what got me to where I was at. I went back to the University of Miami. I trained my behind off. I lost weight. If I felt like I gained weight, I was because every offseason we all have a party. The offseason is a party. You're training, but you're partying. You, you're exhaling <laughs> for those six or seven months you spent just being cooped up. Because I'm one of those guys, when I get away, I get away. When it's time to work, I work. I don't sit there and allow what's going on at home to affect my job. No, this is the only way I'm going to be able to enjoy those things. So I have to work. So I'm all in when it's time to work. And when I'm done, when they say, let's break, I break. I have a great time. <laughs> that year, I kind of knew that, okay, here I am coming to a new team. I want to show these people who they got. I really want to show them Santana Moss. And I bust my behind, and it wasn't no different from any other year, but I was more conscious of what the job had to be and what I had to do with this job. This is an opportunity of a lifetime to, one, be traded. People might look at it as a bad thing, but no, it was the best thing happened to me because, one, no offense to New York, I just didn't feel I was home. You know how when you know something really just not for you? Yeah. I just didn't feel it was home. Now, I played good football. I loved the fans. I loved the people that even hated me because, you know, they was always a part of why I was so special or why I did things because you fueled a fire. But I knew it wasn't home. So when I got a chance to come to Washington, I'm like, here I am. I remember the week leading up to draft. That's where they said I was coming, to Washington, D.C. And whatever happened, whatever transpired, it didn't happen. 
but I'm here now. Before I played a game here, before I stepped off Mr. Snyder's private jet, I knew I was coming home. I knew it. And I put the work in with the team. We put the work in together, you know, leading up to the games. First game is in the books. We go out and beat Chicago Bears week one at home, six zip. That week we lost the quarterback. Patrick Ramsey was our starter. Mark Brunel comes in. You would have thought me and Mark Brunel had been playing the whole entire training camp together. We didn't. But he was a veteran. He's a guy I grew up watching. He was a Jacksonville guy that I watched him throw passes to Jimmy Smith and Keenan McCardell. And I'm like, he don't even know it, but I'm in awe to be sitting on the same field <laughs> in the same huddle and catching passes from him. I grew up loving him. I grew up like that was one of the hometown teams. So anything Mark Brunel said or did, I was going to do it regardless. But I was prepared. I was prepared because I put the work in. And if you think about that Monday night, it was nothing like I've ever lived ever when it comes to the preparation part. We did that. But I remember the night before the game, Porter's mom was in Dallas with us, and they had a relative or something. They did a big meal. We ate ribs and poke beans and you <laughs> name it. We ate everything fattening. And that's not my normal routine the night before the game. I try to stay as light as possible. You eat the right things, put the right nutrition in you. And I was just like, F it, you know, for some odd reason. I'm like, man, we won our first game. I'm celebrating a little bit. This has been a great start to a new chapter in my football career. F it. Let me have a piece of this rib and these baked beans and the baked beans with ground beef in them. I'm okay, talking about. Wait, I'm hungry we, right now. We went ham. And I remember the next day waking up. Porter's mom was like, you know, I got some more of that food left over. And me and Porter looked at each other. We went in that room and got more food. Oh. So. It's crazy and it's odd, but if you watch that entire game, we didn't do anything. As a team, we didn't. And that's one of the reasons why when the fans ask me questions about the game that I remember the most and the game that signifies, you know, who I was here, I don't always say that game. I do know that game did because it did a lot because it was the only two teams playing that night. And it was on the Cowboys ring ceremony when it came to putting – Emmett Smith, Michael Irvin, who was a fellow Hurricane, and Troy Aikman, the triplets, into their ring of honor. So it was so much riding on that game beyond the game. It magnified what my performance and me and Mark Burnell performance, you know, was after that game a little bigger, made it larger than life. But I recall late in the game, I'm pissed off. I haven't done anything. I haven't. You know, you would look at the opposing guys who's covering me and say, they're just locking Santana Moss up. I felt that way because I wasn't accomplishing nothing. No balls was thrown my way. The opportunities wasn't given. Not like most wide receivers. They tag us as divas. They say, wide receiver <laughs> position in the NFL, he has to be a diva. You have to be a guy that wants, 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 and wants, 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 wants. I've never <laughs> been that guy. I understood football a little differently. I played multiple positions that allowed me to know that it's more and it's deeper than just me. So I've always been the guy to just say, hey, if the coach is going to give me the opportunity, then I'm going to make sure I relish in the moment and do what I have to do. But it's not about me. So if it's not coming my way, find another way to make a difference. That's been me all my career. So long story short, which I've been long, I was pissed off on the sideline late in the game. We in the fourth quarter game was about over. Porter's come asking me what's going on. You know what I'm pissed off for. I could have been blasting off to the coaches, but I just hold it in and – Portis was stepped away from me, came back with a coach, and the coach, like, you know, told Portis why I was mad. I said, we didn't run none of the plays that we practiced all week. I said, I was dog-tired on Friday from running this play, that play, this play, that play, and we haven't ran one yet for me. And Coach Gibbs came to me and said, you want to run the Dino? I'm like, yes. And it was a play that we had made up because of the guy who was going to be covering me. He was a fellow Jet with me. Mm. And I'm like, this guy get beat on this route by Marvin Harrison. Every time we played them, we played them twice a year. When I was in the AFC East playing with the Jets, I'm like, when we play the Indianapolis Coast, Marvin Harrison run the same route. I can beat him on this route. I can run any route. One of the things about me that made me special as a receiver, and I'm going to sit here and brag about myself a little bit, I ran any and everything you asked. It wasn't a route I couldn't do, and it wasn't a ball that I couldn't go get. Whether it's high, deep, short, I was going to be you know, the guy to come up with it. So coach said, yeah, I remember we ran that in practice. Let's do it. What the heck? We had nothing to lose. And before you know it, all I remember, it was the first touchdown. Bing. <laughs> and if you watch the expressions of me after the first touchdown, I was like, oh, well, you know, I scored. At least I don't I have to worry about going home feeling that depleted like I didn't do anything. 
And I remember coming on the sideline, and you can see the whole momentum shift a little bit. And I remember sitting on the sideline, like, wasn't all the way happy, but I was like, damn, it felt good to get in the end zone. This is my first touchdown as a Redskin. You know, this is the second game of the season. Last week I had a pretty good game. Now this is my first touchdown. And I'm like, man, this Redskins starting off pretty good. I wish we could have won this game. And I remember Coach coming back to me and say, get your breather. If they give us the ball back, we're going right back at them. And so now I'm watching like, oh, man, you know what? We have – I look up at the clock. It's enough time. And I believe it was Sean Taylor. You know, God bless the dead. He made a play. And all I remember, everybody going to get their hammers. I'm like, ooh, we got another chance. And we didn't waste no time. Coach called the play. It wasn't the Dino play that I ran before. It was a play – you know, similar, but it was on the opposite side of the field. And I remember lining up. I don't know if someone jumped off sides or it was something that happened that caused both sides or one side to blow the whistle or the refs to blow the whistle. And when they did that, Coach said, you know what, we didn't get the look we wanted from the defense. That switched sides. And when we switched sides, we got the look. And the play was perfect play for the look they gave us. And all I remember when I saw Roy Williams, the safety who was on my side, he was flat-footed. He was already known not to be a runner. He couldn't really run. He was a hitter. He was uptight and flat-footed. And I'm like, he don't know I got a play that's going to go behind him. And regardless if he's helping this Kona out, he's so far, I'm going to run right through these guys. I'm going to run. They got enough space in between them. I'm going to push my guy enough wide to make him think I'm going out, and then I'm going to beeline to the post. And – Having a veteran quarterback like Mark Brunel, he made that play what it was today. Because I remember when I put my foot in the ground, my college coaches always tell me, Tanner, anytime you're running those deep routes, especially post routes, when you get to your point, when you stick them, make sure you drive three steps before you look up. You know, as a young kid, and this stuff I teach young receivers, and when I teach my kids, like, they have a problem with running, looking back for the ball. The ball's not coming. It's all timing. And I remember I was just floating. I had my periphery, Ken Roy, and I had my eyes kind of down looking at Aaron Glenn, who was covering me. And I'm like, Roy hasn't moved back yet. I said, well, oh, well, I'm going by him. And I stuck that foot in the ground. And before I looked up, I took my one, two, three, and I did this, and the ball was in the basket. And when I saw that I was already behind Roy, Aaron had recovered, but he missed the ball. I was like, it's a wrap. And I remember seeing the (laughs) chief. He's another guy who I thought the world of. He was a guy that I grew up watching when I watched those Cowboys and Redskins games. The Chief was sitting there telling me to come on, come on to me. (laughs) We just shocked the world. And, man, it's a memory. that I would never forget it because it was my welcome to D.C. moment. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Nobody ever forgets that. Okay, I feel like I was at the game right there. I did, too. I did, too. That was amazing. Wow. Santana, that was a huge risk. Yeah. For the Redskins, how important is it to take risks? You know, I think in life you have to sometimes. And in life, the only way you're going to be able to have what you want or go after something is going to be a risk involved. You know, it's always a sacrifice. To this day, I talk about sacrifices to my kids. To this day, I talk about sacrifices to the kids that I mentor at the camps that I have in the summer, a Moss Academy camp. You have to sacrifice something to have what you want or to give yourself a chance at that goal. And whether it's taking something away from yourself or saying I'm going to roll the dice on myself, those are sacrifices. And that's what it's about sometimes. You have to jump out there and do it. If you don't do it, you'll sit here and be questioning yourself, man, I should have took that chance, you know? I should have. Would have, could have, should have. Right. You can't live in those moments, yeah, you know? So right. you have to go out there and say, you know what? We need it. We got to do it. At the end of the day, what can be worse? Not doing it, you know what I mean? Not Mm -hmm. trying. And so I find myself doing it a lot in life. Like, hey, if I'm going to feel bad about not trying it, let me try. Mm. What would Santana Moss be afraid of? And how do you define fear? I don't know, because to tell you the truth, it was at one point in time that I was scared of any and everything when it came to just me not being the guy who I want to be in life, you know? Mm. It was things that I would say to myself, like, hey, I feared when I came to the NFL just to get here. I feared being the guys that I've watched that just made it and then you hear nothing else about them. I feared that. I got hurt my first fan appreciation practice, meaning it was the first practice and training camp where the fans came out and watched the talent. They wanted to see the guy who they got first round. I got hurt. 
tore my knee up. Do you know what was going through that young 22-year-old mind? Damn. What I feared has just happened to me. Damn. I haven't even stepped a foot on a real NFL field to show them what they got. And here I'm on the shelf already. I feared that. That's why when I look at the 14 years later and I say, man, look what I accomplished. It's because I feared not being great and I feared not being successful. I feared not being the guy that you thought I was. That's why I went about my business the way I did. I didn't bitch and moan because I felt that it's always the right time when the time comes. If it's not now, it's not meant. When I got hurt, it wasn't my time. Someone else had to shine. And it's crazy because when I was a Jet, if I don't get hurt, Lavernius Coles never gets seen. And I say that to this day because he don't know how much he meant to my career because I watched him when I got my first practice and I came home. My receiver coach, Curtis Johnson, he's the receiver coach for the New Orleans Saints. He said, Tanner, so how do receivers look? I said, our best receiver on that team is Lavernius Cole. And he was like the fourth or fifth receiver. He said, for real? See, one thing I have that I've always known I had, I had an alpha talent. If they tell me to go look at somebody right now, give me 10 guys to look at, and I will point out the best one. I guarantee you. And it's, sometimes it's easy, but I'm not saying it just to say it. I've done it every year. When we bring guys into camp that's not draft picks, hey, Coach, he's going to make the team. That one right there going to make it. And I swear to you, I haven't been wrong. And so I've always had that eye. So when I went through the practices and I saw Lavernius Coles cutting, I'm like, they don't give this guy a chance. You haven't gave him a chance. I was his opportunity. I got hurt. It wasn't my time. I was here. I did all I had to do to get here. But it's somebody has been working just as hard as me that deserved the opportunity. See, I believe that's how life goes. I swear to you. When I was sitting there with my leg in that brace and I'm watching him shine, I was grateful. Because now I got a chance to sit back and watch him and say, you know what? I need to do it like that when I get back. I need to have that kind of intensity that kind of swagger, I need to do it like that. I needed to sit down and have this moment to watch the guys in front of me. Maybe I wouldn't have started the way I started if I had to be thrown into the fire. And you know, like some of these quarterbacks sometimes, they're not ready and they're thrown into the fire and then five years later you don't hear about them. And so I look back at it and I'm like, that was the best thing that happened to my career. I was able to get hurt. Yes, it was the worst at the time, but I was able to find the silver lining, you know, and I came back. Like I say, it built everything that I had in me a little stronger and made me a different person because now I say everything that I feared just happened. Now what you going to do about it, you know? Yeah. Anna, you've mentioned in the past that you have to pay to play. Yeah. This is in regards to staying healthy. What do you mean by that? You know, when I was young, I shared with you already this story about before I played my first preseason game, I got hurt. And after that injury, I missed so much time that first year I was young, so I thought that once that injury was over, I can get back out there and be myself again. And I immediately found out that, no, you have to, you know, get yourself back. You have to train your body back to be in that shape that you was in to be able to go out there and do the things that you was doing before. I didn't know, and I went out there immediately trying to see that same speed that I had before, be that same guy. And I end up blowing my quad. I end up pulling hamstrings. I did all this after a knee injury, and I'm wondering, like, what is going on with me? Like, here I am. I done made it to the pinnacle of all to me. Because if you're a professional athlete, that's the pinnacle. When you set foot on that football field, you want to be a pro one day. And that's where I made it to. And now I'm having these issues. I'm having these problems. From going through some of the bumps and bruises and the ups and downs that I went through as a rookie and my sophomore season, I remember – Guys like Curtis Martin, Mo Lewis, you name it, Terrell Buckley. These guys was all on my team, and they would share with me, like, Tanner, do you have a masseuse? Do you have a chiropractor? Do you have a guy that could come in and see what's going on with you? And I'm like, I'm young. I'm a young pup. Now, I'm a sponge because I'm soaking up everything these guys ever tell me, and I just want to hear more about it. So I'm like, no, I don't have that. You guys have it? Like, I need to find out what's going on. And Curtis Martin would share with me. He was like, Tanner. These guys can only do so much. The guys in our training facility who works for the team, they only can do so much. There's so many guys they have to see to, and they don't have the equipment in here to know what's really going on with you. You have to spend the money to go out there and get the person that's right for you. Now I have people. I can set up some appointments for you, and you can see my people and see if you like them. But you got to find somebody that knows you. That was the pay-to-play thing. You have to spend the money on your body, on your asset. 
this is the biggest asset, what I use every day to go out there and obtain the other assets. I found out quickly as a young pro that if I didn't spend the money on the extra stuff, I used to actually leave the stadium or leave the practice facility. And this is like four years removed now from those days because when I was young, I still ain't know it. I didn't start tapping into this until my fourth year as a Jet. I found out these guys who was a chiropractor, the Exposito brothers, and honestly, they was the first people that changed how I felt. I gave them a lot of credit to my last year as a Jet because I went through a lot of bumps and bruises, ups and downs that first half of the season as a fourth-year guy. And late in the season, I just took off like a rocket. And it's because the Exposito brothers found out that I had I wasn't balanced. And that was a reason a lot of these injuries was occurring. And so immediately I'm like, oh, man, I got it now. So these guys are showing me. So I was spending the money. I was seeing them twice a week. And my game was rising. I'm like, man, this is what Curtis Martin was talking about. And then now here I am, boom, I'm out the door. I'm out the door the next year. I get here. And all the guys telling me about a guy that's here that they're going to be seeing. They was like, don't you have problems with your hamstring, Tanner? I'm like, yeah, man, I never know when these things are going to give on me. I laid on the guy's table, and the guy looked at me and said, I just saw you a couple of months ago in a playoff game, and you ran back a punt return. And every guy who I treat on that team, the Pittsburgh Steelers team, told me you was the fastest guy they ever went up against. How was you able to run with your body looking like this? So I looked down at my body immediately like, what do you see? <laughs> and he shared with me that his profession, his line of work, he see the body inside out. He can look at me, you know, how I'm looking today, fully clothed, and see different. Like he see the inside. He see the muscles where they strain, where they torn, where the hips are off, where the joints are out of place. He saw all that. He said, Tana, don't worry. If you were able to do that like this, wait till I get hold of you. And he fixed me up that day, and I promise you, the next day I went on the field, I was a different person. I felt like 18-year-old Santana Moss, I swear to God. And I didn't even ask him how much he cost. I said, you know what, man, I don't know what they're paying you, but I got you. And that was the guy. I went back to what Curtis Martin told and shared with me. He said, you have to find somebody that knows your body. This man met me one day and told me what was going on. Every point that he poked on me without me telling him, it was hurt. It was bothering me. And he just knew where it was all stemming from. He was like, well, this knee's still weak. The knee that I had the surgery on, you haven't built the muscles around it. This is causing this. This is causing that. This is hamstring is, is about to pop soon if I don't get hold to this glute. This glute is not firing. And, man, look here. Honestly, to tell you the truth, we're friends to this day. We're family. That's my brother. You know, he actually, it was the only way I was able to make it to 14 years in the NFL because he was there from 05 to 2014 with me. And I was like, man, you know, so I'm grateful to have a guy like that. Regardless of the money that I gave him, because he was a guy that was from out of state and he had to always come and see me, it was worth it. Because I went out there and he's always telling me, hey, leave it on the field, I can fix it. And so he basically told me, go out there and do what I do best. Don't think about it, do what I do, and he can fix it. And he was worth every penny. I heard you use the word grateful. What is gratitude? How does that play in your life? I'm just grateful to be living this life, breathing this air, talking to you guys. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's me in a nutshell. I don't look at nothing more or less from life, you know. I feel like the only way the motor <laughs> goes is what you put in it, and the only way you're able to put what you put in it is to go out there and get it, you know. And it's odd the way I word things and say things, but that's just how I believe. I believe that it's all up to you, you know. I have a quote, grind for what you want. And it's crazy. I was reading a book, and the first thing I saw when the guy said to his kid, work for what you want. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. That's a testimony in my life. Work for what you want. When I wanted something, made my sacrifices. It's funny because I'm superstitious, and I'm not sure if you guys can pick that out of me just by talking to me. But I remember in college, I was a walk-on to the University of Miami. I came in on a track scholarship, and I had to play immediately in my freshman year. And I remember— the first four games when I wasn't playing, I was just living the life. Like, man, I'm dressing out, but I don't have to play. My friends can see me on the sideline. <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm here. I, next year is my year, fellas. You know, I'm going to play. But at the same time, I was putting in work every week. And then they threw me out there one game. The one game I didn't leave my helmet inside, it made me leave my helmet inside for the first four weeks. 
So I found it all. I said, man, you know, I'm tired of getting beat up by every school student body. They're throwing ice at me, <laughs> throwing cups at me, you name it, <laughs> picking on me because I'm not in. And I'm sitting in front of the student body watching the game like them. And I want to fight everywhere we went. I was, that's all I knew. I want to fight. I'm Man, look here, man. Don't play at me like that. I'm not that person. But I had to like, hey, you know, that's their job to get on us, you know. <laughs> and the one game I said, you know what, I'm going to trick all these guys. I'm taking my helmet out. <laughs> You know, I used to take my helmet out for warm-ups, and then when we go in right before the game start, they say, all the guys who's going to red shirt, leave your helmets in. You just stay on the sideline with your ball cap on and a towel and watch the game. Now I'm fully dressed. That's not looking good, you know what I mean? I'd rather be in plain clothes and watching the game than be a guy with shoulder pads, pants, <laughs> and I'm right, that's riding the pound, you know what I mean? So here I am, I'm like, I'm taking my helmet out this week. They're not going to fool me. Look. I'm going to put it on, and I'm going to sit there and watch the game with my helmet on. At least you might think I'm getting in the game. Well, to my luck, they threw me in the damn game, and I'm like, no, I'm red shirt. And the dude's like, I just got a call. They say, put Moss in. And I, I swear to you, I was running into the game like, damn. I, did I just put myself in a situation that I wasn't ready for? But I was ready. I was ready. That play, the first play of my collegiate career, I got a ball thrown to me. I caught a post corner from out of the slot. For a third down, that translated to a first down. And I made a play. And I'm sitting there like, wow. You know, and that was welcome to college football. But at the same time, I'm saying to myself, here I am trying to trick the student body, but I got tricked. <laughs> right. But at the same time, it worked in my favor because now they took that moment and say, next week, you playing. Mm -hmm. You know, you playing. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I say, you know, I'm grateful for a lot yeah. of things because – you know, it's up to you to be ready for moments, any moment in life, good or bad. And I felt like I was just ready, not even knowing I was ready, but I was putting in the work. I was doing what I had to do to be ready. And so the sacrifices, get back to what I was talking about, the sacrifices, I was a odd kid because, you know, in college we have moments. You know, I'm pretty sure if you guys went to college, you know, Thursday night is college night. Mm -hmm. Everybody we goes have and children have their, that <laughs> are in college. Okay. Everybody going to have the drinks and I was the odd guy. I was like, you know what? I want to partake in that, but I'm going to make it tough on myself to make sure that on Saturdays, I'm at my best because I didn't go to college night. I'm going to stay home. I'm going to watch whatever's on TV. Most of the time it was sports. And I'm going to I'm gonna make these sacrifices, and it's only for me to play well. And my mind was so messed up that if I didn't even play good, that had nothing to do with it. That was just me. I didn't play good because of me, but I did what I had to do because I didn't want nothing in my mind to say that this was the cause of this. I never wanted to have that hurt or that anger of saying that, well, man, I didn't do what I was supposed to do and that would cause this effect. So I would do that. And being lucky, I don't know if you want to say it, but I found myself being successful. And I'm like, whoo, I'm riding this wave. <laughs> and guys would be like, man, where's Tanner? Like, oh, he ain't going to come out on Thursday, but he going to come out to the game if he have a good one. And it was just like, after that game over, y'all going out tonight? <laughs> I played good. I don't know. We might not won, but I went out and did that. You know what I mean? So I found myself, to, to this day, I still make those same sacrifices. I would take something from myself or tell myself I can't do something so I can see what I'm really trying to see. Mm -hmm. So I won't have no ill feel or thoughts in my head to say, well, the reason why I didn't, you know, achieve that goal or didn't achieve what I wanted is because I allowed myself to do something that wasn't in my train of thought or something that I didn't normally do. And your brother's a professional football player. He played so. too. Yes, yeah. he played too. Now he's acting. He's out in Hollywood. Some nurse. He actually got a Super Bowl ring. Wow. It's funny because we have a lot of stories that we share, me and Travis, back and forth on our podcast about my brother and just other guys in the league who have brothers or relatives and the path that they took. And people feel to realize, you know, I remember these days vividly because the way I got into the University of Miami, crawling and praying and hoping that I can even get in there to be able to play football. I got in there on track. You would say normally most kids that's going to come in on a track scholarship is going to walk on a team. He's just going to be a part of that team. I was football first, but I had to get in there how I had to. Now, my career in high school was way different from my brother's. I had a more successful high school career and won a state championship and was one of the reasons of us having that title. My brother didn't do half of that and walked into that door with a full ride at the University of Miami. But you got to understand, someone has to go through the mud first, and it was me. So <laughs> yeah. I don't fault him for doing that. Hey, I applaud him. Hey, I'm glad to open those doors. In the same way in the NFL, the year I came to Washington, it was his senior year. 
in college. And I would score a touchdown on Monday night. He would score a touchdown Saturday. And they talked about us as a pair. You know, when the sportscasters was talking, well, hey, that Santana Moss just did what he did Monday night. This is his little brother. He's going to be doing the same thing someday. It was almost like set up for you just to ride that coattail, you know, and mm-hmm. he did that. And But then when he got here through some injuries and just bad luck, he didn't have the same career, you know, and it was hard on him. But he was always into acting and modeling. You know, that's something that was one of his passions. And so, you know, he went out and still had a great six years here in the league, rather. And now the other chapter has kind of opened up. He's taking baby steps, but he's growing in the profession. And, you know, soon, someday you'll see him on the big screen. I really, truly believe that. And the only way you can do anything in life is believe it first. And that's what we know best. No matter how hard it takes or how long it takes, you'll see him on the big screen sooner or later. You know, what would your 21-year-old self tell yourself now at almost 40? I'm going to be whatever I am at 40. I'm going to be the same guy. I'm going to obtain any and everything that I set my mind out to. 21-year-old was scared. Like I said, I was scared. Today, I'm scared. I'm scared to not do what I want to do. That's why I sacrifice and make the sacrifices and do the things according to how I do it. You know, when my friends want to hang out and go to the club, if it wasn't the day that I normally would go to the club, I'm not going because I'm playing games in my head. That's going to not allow me to have what I want. Now, when it comes to a party, I know how to party. I I won't lie to you, but... (laughs) It's a time and a place, you know, and the 21-year-old, I had my trials and tribulations just like the 40-year-old, the guy who's going to be 40 in a couple of weeks. But Mm -hmm. at the same time, any and everything that I'm doing or going through, I know where it starts. It's with me. Santana, we talk about health through a mind, body, spirit lens. Mm -hmm. So how do you take care of yourself today, mind, body, and spirit? So the guy that you see today live a different life when it comes to health. The 21 and up until 35, I care less what I ate. I ate a lot of fried foods. I only worked out when I knew I had to work out for my profession. And you know what? I was going to look how I looked because it was just genetics and I had that gift. But when I turned 35, I realized that gift wasn't really a gift. That was just me, you know, and the age was allowing me to have that kind of life. Now I have a strenuous workout regimen. Every day I work out. I'm either riding my bike or my Peloton in the basement or lifting. I lift and do cardio every day and abs every day. And even the days I don't, I feel like I cheated myself and I do double the next day. And when I want something more from what I'm doing, I add two a days. I would do something in the morning and I would do something before I go to bed. You know, I feel like health is wealth. I don't say it because everyone says it now. I truly believe it. If I don't work out, I don't clear the thoughts that I have in my head sometimes. You know, I remember one of my friends said something to me and I found it odd because I almost questioned our friendship. He asked me a question about, am I stressing about my career being over? Because I work out every day. I'm like, no, this is what I know. This is what helped me be the person I was in my career. And now that I'm done, don't mean I need to stop being that person. I still have to be Santana, whether I'm, you know, playing football or not. Whatever allowed me to go out there and be successful you know, that had my mind and my mental, everything right, then I'm going to continue to do those things because just because that stopped don't mean I have to stop. But like you say, he didn't know. He was wondering and worrying, but you worrying about the wrong thing, brother, because like I said, I'm built a little different. I understood that everything that I went through allowed me to have some kind of success. So why stop that? Continue to run those same paths. Now you're just in different doors. I'm in different you know, element of my career now. My game is a little different. Yeah, it's, it's not the same game, but it's still a game to me. I'm trying to be the best at this game. The only way I can be the best is be the best. You know, prepare to be the best. And being physically fit will help my mental. Because, you know, we all sit there and wonder at times. You know, we all have those thoughts. So let me clear that one thought. Let me go out here and do what I have to do to be right. And then now I can save that those other thoughts that I have on now, what's next? You know, I have kids that look out there. They young. Most of them is still young. My youngest is a two-year-old. You think I bought a stop now? Nah. I got to be able to still run around with this two-year-old. When I'm 50-something, she going to be just graduating from high school. You understand? So it's just like, why stop? You can't stop because you have people that depend on you to keep going. So therefore, you just got to find a new way to do it. 
So Santana, if you had a favorite quote, what would that be? A favorite one I shared with you. It's work for what you want. Mm -hmm. I promise you. That's where I got that from. Mm -hmm. It was another one in there that stood out to me. Our train of thought makes us who we are. Whatever we Mm -hmm. put in, whatever we believe in, that's what you're going to be. Santana, thank you for sharing your story. Thank you. And Mm -hmm. you've been so inspiring. And we're just dedicating this to our sons, (laughs) this show, because they wish they were sitting here. That's what's up. That's what's up. Well, tell them I said, hey, you know. It's always a privilege, honestly. You know, one of the things that I get a kick out of now, and it's odd, because I was a guy that said not that much when I played. I would get in front of the camera and back my team up and myself anytime that need be. But I wasn't a guy that's going to jump out there and be heard all the time. I didn't feel like you needed to be heard. Actions speak louder than words. I live by that. Actions speak louder than words. Say less, do more. And so now I'm not playing anymore. So you don't see me. So now I like to be heard a little more, you know, because I have a lot of insight and I have a lot of things that might be different or you might find intriguing. And so therefore, I like to share that with people, especially, you know, these kids. to come. That's one of the things I do now with my foundation. I have the 89 Ways to Give Foundation out here in Loudoun County that, you know, one of the things I want to be a staple in a community. I just want to be a guy that when these kids grew up, I had Santana Moss. He showed us the way. He gave to us when we didn't have... He made some of my Christmases better. He made some of the cold days better with the coat drives. He made the school supplies better when my mom didn't have the money. He did the little things, and we was able to take some of that inspiration that he gave us from showing how you can give to others and now pass it on. And that's why I do what I do. And then when the guys want to be ball players or better ball players and want to ask me questions, the door is open. You know, I'm not a person that you can't touch. And I tell them to touch me. If they touch me, if I'm out to a school and I'm talking to your kid and I say, touch me, I'm not trying to be slick. No, touch me. Because if you can touch me, then you can be me Mm -hmm. and be better than me. And so I try to put it into them because a lot of these kids don't know it's up here. Everything you want in life is right here. And it's up to you to go out there. Do you mean Sean Taylor? Is that your inspiration? Is that who you said was your inspiration, Sean? Well, Sean was one of my guys. No, but, you know, I'm saying like far as. Right now, it's just, you know, as a total, yeah. you know what I mean? Like I said, my parents played a big role in it. When Sean passed, yes, I spoke. I know, I, spoke I remember that. Dividends. You know, yeah, I spoke I highly about some of the things that was going on in my life at that time made me wake up. I was just laughing because the other day, you know, somebody asked me, like, Tanner, how many cars did you have at one time? I told him I had 10. And that was around that time when I woke up. Like, man, you know what? Life's too short. And I'm around here worrying about this and that. I need to you know, cut some of this stuff, you know. He was and a so, great friend of yours. No, a great yeah. friend. Great. And it's crazy because I didn't play college ball. He was much younger than me. He played ball with my brother at University of Miami. And I got to know him more here when I got traded here. I would come home in the off season and see him on campus because I went back to the University of Miami all the time to work out. And I just heard the stories. So I was wild like everybody else, just watching this kid look like a man walk around, but was a kid. You know, when he was in college, he was a kid. And even as a pro, Sean Taylor was a bright individual that still had a lot of kid in him. And he laughed and joked about stuff that people would find odd. We would laugh and sit, and we sat by each other a lot on the planes, <laughs> in meeting rooms, and even sometimes that little week leading up to his death on the training table, you know, next to each other getting treatment, treating our injuries. So I find it at times it's emotional for me to talk about it, but then it's at times I can handle myself because I look at a lot of the bright sides. But he was a guy, man, that I can also, you know, say that helped me with a lot of stuff that I was going through in life because you look at it and say, man, you're still here. You know, we can't take this life for granted. He didn't take it for granted. It was taken away from him, but he didn't take it for granted. And some of the things that I look back on, I just find it odd, man, because people don't realize it until you're gone, you know. You fast forward now, you had a guy in Nipsey Hussle. He was a musician. He was a rapper out of Crenshaw, you know, West Coast guy. And people are going crazy about this guy. He just passed, you know, someone shot him, took his life. And I was a fan of his before he became the big Nipsey hustle who he is now, today. And it was crazy because one of my friends was like, Tanner, you been saying something about this guy's music. And it was a message. And it was almost reminding me of the message that I was getting from Tupac. And Tupac was a great inspiration in my life. He was somebody that to this day I still listen to his lyrics. And I'm like, man, he was talking to me. And being that he was a Gemini like myself, I felt like he was almost talking to me or I was going through some of the similar pains he was going through. But guys like that, you know, Sean Taylor was an inspiration to more than just me. He put a stamp on the way he played and got a lot of guys playing the way he played. And 
the things that I got from him, just, you know, the joy that he always expressed, that last Thanksgiving that we shared, that he told every coach, happy Thanksgiving. You know what? It was something right there that showed me something different that day, you know? And so that's why I say I don't take life for granted. That's why I appreciate getting up. That's why I appreciate this opportunity talking to you guys because any and everything you do in life is only going to add to what you have later. Mm -hmm. Think about it. It's going to add more dark or brightness. So a lot of people don't know that. You've added a lot of brightness to our day, for sure. Thank you for joining us on Health Gig. We loved having you with us. We hope you'll tune in again next week. In the meantime, be sure to like and subscribe to this podcast and follow us on healthgigpod.com. I'm Trisha. And I'm Doro. Be well.